great. So it's our great pleasure, of course, to introduce our speaker today, uh, John Shabley, who's an assistant professor in physics at the University of Arizona. Um, you've been uh, here for three years, John? I, uh, four. four. Oh, four. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Uh, time flies. Yeah, I know. Uh, uh, so John did his PhD at the University of Michigan and a, and a brief postdoc at the University of Washington. Uh, more importantly, he's won the AF, AFOSR uh, Young Investigator Award and also the Science Foundation of Arizona's Bistro of Scholars Award. Uh, why it's really exciting today is because his talk uh, focuses on 2D semiconductor heterostructures, especially excitons in it. And uh, we're really looking forward to it. I think it's going to be a fantastic learning experience for the grad students, especially because these talks are targeting our grad students. And right. normally in our department, we do try, and at ASU, we try to you know divide it between more fundamental science talks and some engineering talks. And uh, due to a quirk in the schedule, there's been a bunch of metallurgy engineering talks. Uh, this is really you know, um, swinging the pendulum back to the science aspects of material. So with that, uh, the floor is yours, John. Okay, so uh, yeah, thank you again. Um, again, I'm gonna be uh, talking about, um, you know, I'll mostly be giving some background about uh, uh, 2D semiconductors and 2D materials in general. And then I'm gonna talk um, a little bit about my work, um, uh, starting back when I was a postdoc and then continuing into really uh, the focus of, um, at least a couple of the projects um, focused on my, my lab here. And so um, you know, this is a, just a photo of my group. And before I forget, I'd like to acknowledge um, uh, uh, a lot of the work at U of A was, um, uh, um, a lot of the students were also co-mentored by my postdoc, uh, Bekele Padada, who's right here. Um, he actually is on the job market right now. It's an, an interesting time to be on the job market, but he is. Um, so if anyone is interested in uh, uh, his CV, uh, you know, please let me know. Again, um, the work I'm going to talk about is most uh, at the end of the talk is mostly uh, Matt's work on these um, 2D material plasmonic structures, which I'll talk about, and then um, really kind of everyone else, uh, Dan, Christine, and Fatima, are all um, working on these uh, 2D header structures, uh, two you know bilayer semiconductor header structures. Uh, I have to acknowledge a very strong collaboration with uh, Brian Leroy uh, here at U of A. We share a lot of lab equipment and space, which has been great. Um, um, also collaborations with Oliver and Rolf here, and then uh, Hung Yi Yu in um, uh, China, uh, David Mandris at Oak Ridge, um, Sep Tongue at ASU, and then um, Watanabe and Tanaguchi at NIMS in Japan, who provide the HPN crystals. And of course, uh, funding from AFOSR, NSF, and um, that, that nice early uh, career uh, grant from uh, Science Foundation of Arizona was uh, especially helpful uh, in my first two years and really building my lab um, really at a, at a level beyond what would have been capable of just startup funds. And so that's been um, phenomenal. Um, and so you know, for those of you who aren't familiar with um, or aren't kind of indoctrinated in, uh, in um, I'd say, modern condensed matter physics, uh, there's been a lot of interest really for the last 15 years on what we call atomically thin two-dimensional crystals. And so these are van der Waals materials. So, you know, you know there, there's well, a whole bunch of them uh, that are studied these days. Of course, the most famous is graphene, which is just a monolayer of carbon atoms. And the distinguishing property of uh, van der Waals materials is you have uh, very strong covalent and or ionic bonds in plane. So this is looking at a molecular monolayer of a, a 2D semiconductor, one of these transition metal dichalcogenides. Um, in this case, you know, graphene has these strong in-plane covalent bonds, but of course we know um, that, you know, you know, for example, you know, pencil lead is in fact made out of graphite and it has this uh, property where if you, you know, rub it on a piece of paper, um, you know, some of the graphite rubs off. And the reason why that happens is you're really kind of like shearing off or peeling off these layers of graphene, um, or in the case of uh, the pencil, a multi-layer graphene or graphite onto the piece of paper. And so it's the van der Waals force that holds these um, layers together in what we call the Z or the, you know, the C axis of the crystal. And so, um, um, like I said, there's you know been a, of course a, a a lot of activity going back to 2004 on graphene. Um, 2D semiconductors. Uh, the first was um, um, molybdenum disulfide MLS2, which was isolated uh, in a monolayer form back in about 2010. And I'll uh, give a kind of a brief history of why, um, especially optical um, condensed matter physicists, have been so interested in these 2D semiconductors for the last 10 years. And then I um, should mention, though, just for completeness, that essentially. Um, uh, you know, 
any kind of uh, material property you can think of for the most part has now been realized in a, a 2D material system. There are 2D topological insulators, there are 2D ferromagnets, there are 2D superconductors. And, um, you, know, the, you know, these days, you know, labs like mine are often, um, you know, trying to come up with clever ways to realize novel effects by not just studying these individual monolayers in their isolated form, but seeing what we can do by stacking these layers together. And so this is a figure that's now, I guess, you know, somewhat dated. Um, I've had this in my you know, talks for a long time, but um, this was um, from a perspective back in 2013. But, you know, it was trying to get this idea out there where um, we can literally stack these different layer materials together to realize atomically thin heterostructures. And so this is reminiscent of, um, you know, you know, you know well-known semiconductor heterostructures, uh, you know, such as gallium arsenide, aluminum arsenide. Um, which of course has been established for many years, but um, you know, at least one of the things that people were interested in and excited about early on is we said, well, what's neat about these Van der Waals heterostructures is not only do we um, have the ability to stack them with you know, atomically sharp interfaces, but we can actually realize heterostructures without um, worrying about lattice matching. And so, um, you know, whereas with traditional, you know, you know, bulk semiconductors where you actually have covalent and or ionic bonds in the vertical direction out of plane, you of course have to have lattice matching or else you have tons of defects. Um, and so, um, you know, come back to this and I, I want to, you know, both um, kind of advertise that as a potential um, um, advantage or um, opportunity with 2D materials to realize, you know, to, for lack of a better word, weird types of structures that are not easy to make with traditional um, semiconductor heterostructure, like MBE type growth, but there's, there, there's a catch and I'll come back to that catch um, later in the talk. Um, but to be uh, specific, I'm gonna talk about um, you know, two, um, uh, two basic uh, uh, 2D material uh, structures that we study. I'm gonna talk about these um, interlayer valley excitons and 2D heterostructures, I'll explain what I mean by valley exciton to talk. Um, and this is two different monolayer semiconductors, in this case, MOSC2 and WSC2 and stack on top of each other. I'll talk about uh, this kind of new direction that we've been working on really since I got here. Um, and it was initially supported with the YIP, and then we got a, a, a new grant this year to keep, um, you know, keep going on this work, which was uh, very exciting, uh, trying to see what we can do by combining these two header structures with plasmonic, um, uh, uh, kind of plasmonic waveguides. I'll explain what's going on in this picture. Um, just to give a little bit of background, again, I think many people have heard um, a little bit about 2D materials, at least within the material science world, but for those of you who aren't uh, familiar, there's um, uh, kind of this um, you know, classic, uh, easy, cheap way that physicists like uh, uh, to use to isolate 2D materials. And that's, you know, first you start with a bulk 2D crystal, which um, you can buy from companies like Graphene or 2D semiconductors. Um, I'm um, fortunate enough to have uh, close colleagues, for example, um, you know, a recent uh, new hire here in UA Physics, uh, Tai Kong is a bulk crystal grower, who's now supplying many of our 2D materials. And then I have this longstanding collaboration with um, uh, David Manders at Oak Ridge, who's always provided my transitional dichalcogenide. Uh, materials, which uh, we're very grateful for. And of course, these are obtained through um, things like chemical vapor transport or um, uh, flux growth. These are uh, you know, essentially, um, you know, um, you know I'm, a, I'm not a grower, so I'm going to simplify this to a probably an oversimplified um, uh, level, but it essentially, you know, in a method like flux growth, you literally mix together molybdenum and selenium powders in a, um, in a sealed tube. You heat them up to very high temperatures, cool them down very slowly. And then if you do this, uh, correctly, you're left with um, these single crystals, which again, you know, just for dimension, uh, this is maybe, uh, you know, um, maybe about one centimeter by um, eight millimeters. The th typical crystal thickness, again, is, um, you know, typically an order of a couple hundred microns. And so what the trick is, is you, you again, this is what a, a physicist like me does, because we're just interested in, at, at this point, understanding the, the fundamental physics of, of ultra, you know, ultra clean uh, monolayers is you can use scotch tape, you peel off a thin layer, you then stick it down on a, on a clean substrate and peel it off. And uh, you look around under an optical microscope until you identify what looks like a thin flake. And so this method, you know, people often, um, you know, attribute this to um, uh, Novoselov and Geim back in 2004, but um, this method of using, you know, 
scotch tape to exfoliate thin flakes has actually been around for decades. If you can read uh, papers back from the 70s where they're using this, um, the one thing that they didn't realize back in the 70s was that you could use this type of method to, uh, to really get down to single uh, monolayers. That's, that's really what led to this, um, uh, this huge kind of a, you know, a revolution or evolution in, uh, in uh, 2D materials that started with, with graphene. And so this is just an example of a microscope image. The, the pink here that we see in the background is just a reflection off of a uh, silicon oxide substrate. Um, there's a little bit of a trick that we pull with, with um, uh, setting the, the, um, the uh, oxide thickness at the right uh, um, uh, thickness so that we get strong contrast when we're looking at these thin layers. Um, and then, uh, you know, what we see here is we see this kind of darker purple and darker purple in this region. And uh, to look at AFM, you can then identify that these are actually corresponding to steps of, of let's say, seven angstroms, which is exactly what you would expect for monolayer steps for these um, uh, transitional dichalcogenides. And again, I, I apologize, I went over this a little fast, but these teams are studying at the uh, chemical formula at MX2. Uh, so the, the, the materials I study are mostly molybdenum disalamide and crust disalamide, but there are many other groups that are very interested in MLS2 and WS2. But um, uh, for a technical reason, I, I prefer uh, uh, these two um, materials. Um, and again, just to give you a little bit of history, um, you know, the, really the pioneering works um, that, that got kind of optics people excited about uh, uh, 2D semiconductors um, was that when you go down from a, you know, a thicker um, crystal of MLS2 and you thin it down to a single monolayer and you look at the photoluminescence intensity, again, as a function of emission energy. So this is just looking at the emission spectrum of a, um, in this case, a two layer thick MOSC2 um, layer and a one layer thick MOSC2 uh, monolayer. And it was shown that when you do a photoluminescence experiment, essentially you shine high energy photons on the sample and then you record a spectrum of the fluorescence off the sample, that there's this huge jump in the quantum yield as a function of layer thickness when you get down to single monolayer. And so this gets, um, you know, got myself included, a lot of optics people, um, many of whom were previously studying systems like indium arsenide quantum dots or gallium arsenide quantum wells saying, oh, well, so now we have this 2D material that has a, um, a bright ex, um, excitonic photoluminescence line, which um, you know, it was you know, discovered shortly thereafter that in fact, the, the optical properties of these uh, 2D semiconductors are dominated not just by interband transitions, but by excitons. And so this is um, a consequence of a, of a few different things, namely that there's a very low in-plane dielectric constant resulting in a very high binding energy. And so, you know, the, these excitons in, in these 2D semiconductors are kind of interesting because they have a very large binding energy, which is reminiscent of, you know, Frank, Frankel or molecular excitons that you'd expect in organic systems, but they're still uh, delocalized, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, block states of the crystal. And so in, in that sense, they look um, kind of like 1A mod excitons in their, in terms of their, um, their character, their, their, they're, they're tightly bound, and so the probability of finding an electron hole near each other is large, but the probability of finding it anywhere in the crystal is, um, is, is low. It's very delocalized. And so, um, and so they're, um, it, it, because of that, it was a very interesting system that kind of united the two different worlds of, um, like I said, gallium arsenide or indium arsenide, um, uh, um, you know, quantum well type of people who um, had studied these delocalized excitons for many decades. And then, you know, the people studying organic semiconductors and carbon nanotubes were again, very familiar with these high binding energy um, excitons. And so it's, uh, it's been interesting because there's really been a merge of these two fields. And because of that, there, there's, um, I'd say been a lot of lively debate. That's a polite way to put it. Um, just to give you a little bit more information of what we're talking about, again, this is uh, just a, a side view of the crystal. This is a top-down view where we see it has the same uh, sort of a honeycomb structure that we're familiar with the graphene. But then if we look at the side, we have a transition metal uh, um, in the middle that's sandwiched between these two layers of culture. Uh, and so, um, again, uh, you know, I, I, a few other kind of details I have to um, uh, I tell you about um, um, the crystal has broken inversion symmetry, which um, um, 
know, is important for uh, certain nonlinear optical effects, but really what I want to focus on are what is the nature of these tract optical transitions. And so I just showed you that it has strong photoluminescence. So anyone um, from a uh, condensed matter physics background or you know, uh, a semiconductor background knows right away that that means that this is a that this material has a direct or nearly direct um, uh, um, band gap. And so the way um, uh, semiconductor physicists uh, think about um, uh, these sorts of crystals is in terms of their single particle band structure. So it's just like, uh, especially the um, crystal momentum for simplicity, the momentum of allowed electronic states as a function of their energy. Of course, in a crystalline system, what you with the solution to to you know the Schrodinger equation in that case is of course we have bands and we have gaps, and what we see is um, and so uh, relative to um, uh, um, you know the Fermi energy in this case we set the valence band equal to zero we see that there's this large gap um, between the highest valence band and the lowest conduction band and these line up at K. And so this is the signature in a band structure that you have a direct optical band gap. And this is exactly why you're, you can have um, efficient photoluminescence. So in, um, in uh, semiconductor physics, or in, uh, um, uh, you, know, if you, you have to simultaneously um, satisfy conservation of energy and conservation of momentum. And so in order for a semiconductor to efficiently emit light, right, the you uh, and given the fact that photons essentially carry negligible momentum um, compared to the very massive momentum that any kind of um, uh, um, electron or hole carries because they're massive particles which you know have a you know, um, you know um, much more momentum of course than photons then that that essentially limits you to vertical transitions so that means that your um, um, your um, valence band and your conduction band have to line up in momentum space and so What's interesting is not just that this is a direct optical band gap, right? There are many semiconductors, um, gallium arsenide, indium arsenide, that have direct optical band gaps, but um, unlike those um, those um, uh, traditional semiconductors, which have a direct band gap here at at gamma equals zero, which corresponds to zero center of mass momentum, uh, or I'm sorry, which corresponds to, to a zero crystal momentum, we are over here at the K point, right? And so because of that. Um, if we you know, think about uh, the electrons and holes in terms of block waves, we know that that corresponds to an electron that has a wave function that goes to like e to the i k dot r, which has a, again, a non-trivial, um, uh, which has a non-trivial phase associated with it. And so this, um, again, was realized fairly early on. Um, and, you know, there, there was a, a lot of excitement, again, about eight years ago now talking about this you know, coupled spin and valley physics of these monolayer semiconductors. And again, the, um, the actual coupling uh, between the spin and valley you know, um, comes about because again, this is a, a two-dimensional depiction of the band structure. And so here um, in the previous, I just looked essentially one direction, but if we look in the, along, instead of looking towards plus K, if we look towards minus K, right, we see that there's both a, um, a, a, a a direct optical gap at plus k and also minus k, and then this has this um, you know threefold rotational symmetry, which is just a consequence of the threefold rotational symmetry of the crystal. And so, um, what that means is that this valley is equivalent to this valley, which is equivalent to this valley, and similarly, that all three minus k valleys are equivalent. Okay, so when we talk about the valley physics of these two D semiconductors, what we're really talking about is you know. Is, is there a way to preferentially put electrons or holes or excitons in one valley or the other valley? Okay. And so, and what, what ends up um, happening in addition to, um, uh, in addition to just having this valley degree of freedom, freedom there's actually this uh, locking and coupling mechanism between the spin and valley degree of freedom, which is again, very similar in many ways to uh, spin orbit splitting in, um, in uh, you know, which again is just a, a coupling between the orbital angular momentum and the spin angular momentum. Well, it turns out that that an electron in one of these valleys that's away from the gamma point has an additional angular momentum that's associated with, um, uh, which is a so associated with the the band itself, 
And so there's an additional valley angular momentum, which you have to uh, consider. And, um, and again, when, when, you, when you go through the details, you end up getting this locking where the, you know, if you consider say the um, spin of electrons and um, you know, the upper valence band of the K valley, this corresponds to spin up electrons, and whereas it's spin down electrons in the minus K valley. Um, and furthermore, this, um, this large um, spin orbit splitting in the ground state, that, again, I, I realize this is a little detail, but that splitting, which I, I call out here on the slide just to explain, that actually comes about not from the valley um, uh, orbital angular momentum, but in fact from the orbital angular momentum because these um, electrons and holes at the K point are associated with these uh, D orbitals, which has an orbital angular momentum of L equals two. So this, this, um, this can be thought of if you're familiar with um, um, uh, traditional semiconductors like gallium arsenide it is actually quite similar to the you know heavy hole light hole um, and a split off band split um, okay and so so this is all just about the, stru the electronic structure of these materials and so what we again got beyond just having this bright monolayer photoluminescence the other thing that got people very excited about these 2d semiconductors was this uh, valley dependent optical selection rule and again, um, in atomic physics, we're, we're again somewhat familiar that we, we know that we can use the polarization state of light to drive certain transitions. That is, we know that photons carry spin one. Um, and so if we have a you know, right circularly polarized photon, for example, it might be, we might define that as sigma plus here, that carries one unit of, of, of angular momentum, which can be imparted onto the electronic system. In the case of an atomic transition, that might be driving from a m equals zero to a, an m equals plus one sublevel in, for example, a 1s to 2p transition. So there's a similar optical selection rule that, that again comes out in that work that comes out in this um, in, the, in, in these um, uh, 2D semiconductors, which is associated with the valley degree freedom. And again, that that what, what happens there is essentially when you're driving a, a, a you know when you're driving an electron from the valence band up to the conduction band leading by in a hole, that corresponds to, to um, absorbing one unit of angular momentum and part it down to the system. Similarly, um, uh, if, you know, for the minus k valley, um, we have to have a minus one uh, unit of angular momentum to drive this transition. And so, you know, again, the, the, the details of that selection rule come about by working out the, the spin, the orbital, and the valley orbital angular momentums of these different transitions. And then you'll see ex exactly where, where that comes from. But from a, um, from a simplified view, we have an optical way to both excite and read out which valley, the, um, which valley we're uh, addressing. So if we shine sigma plus polarized light on the sample, we only excite electrons in this valley. If we shine sigma minus polarized light on the sample, we're only excite electrons in this valley. And so this is very, um, this is, I said, what got the most excitement is when now we have this, we have two different distinguishable valleys in these 2D semiconductors. And we have an optical way both to write and read out the, the valley state, which is you know, a, a kind of a, a new degree of freedom like spin, but it's not spin. It's which, which momentum space valley the electron occupies. And this was, um, again, um, uh, uh, first shown in, um, in polarization dependent photoluminescence measurements. And so again, the simplest measurement you can think of, I shine, for example, sigma minus polarized light on the sample. And if this optical selection rule works, then the light that comes out of the sample should also be co-polarized with the excitation, which should also be sigma minus polarized. And so we define this thing that value polarization, which is just the difference between the co and cross polarized photoluminescence divided by the sum. And you see that the photoluminescence is all sigma minus polarized, whereas the sigma plus channel where you essentially flip your polarizer the other way to measure the cross polarized signal is essentially zero. And so this again gives us an optical way both to write and read valley polarization. And so this uh, gave rise to this um, idea of so-called valleytronics and an analogy to spintronics where we could perhaps store information in this valley degree of freedom. One idea is you know, perhaps there's a way to dope the sample. In this case, I showed doping it with holes and then maybe preferentially polarizing the whole population into the plus K valley. Uh, this sort of thing has been done using you know, um, techniques such as uh, ferromagnetic 
um, you know, substrates, where, which we remember, of course, that as I mentioned a second ago, the spin is, is coupled to valley. So if we can inject spin polarized poles, they will preferentially go into this valley. Um, but, you know, the types of things people think about here that was just using this as an additional resource. So not only do you have, um, you know, if you, for example, have a charge current, you have um, a company with that a valley current. Um, something that I was a little bit more interested in, uh, especially a couple of years ago, was if we can you know, realize something like an excitonic valley polarization and realize something like a pure valley current, where instead of having um, 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 uh, you know, a, a flow of electrons or holes, you could realize, you know, uh, these, you know, inject these valley polarized excitons. An exciton is a Coulomb bound electron hole pair, so it is net charge neutral. And so in principle, you could realize a pure excitonic valley current with, with negligible dissipation because you don't have any um, scattering off of um, any long range Coulomb scattering, I should say, off of things like um, you know, optical phonons or, or defects because it's again, transporting a charge neutral particle. And so, um, uh, you know, when we were first thinking about this, we said, well, if we think about this monolayer exciton, it's actually quite difficult to transport um, even though it's, you know, charge neutral. Um, it, you know, it, it's not a very good information storage device because the lifetimes of this is an optically excited state and it has a very short lifetime of really less than, um, I say less than five picoseconds for an, it really more recent measurements have actually shown that the lifetime is less than one picosecond. And so we were interested in early on, and again, this is very much guided by our knowledge of, um, you know, the work done in gallium arsenide header structures is, is there a way to realize some sort of interlayer exciton system where we have a hole in one layer and electron in the other layer, which are bound together by the Coulomb interaction. So we call this a bound interlayer exciton. And so um, this again got again, a lot of attention um, a, a few years back, uh, both uh, theoretically and experimentally. And what happens specifically if you stack WSE2 on top of MOSC2, you realize what um, we call a type two semiconductor heterojunction. What that means is that the lowest conduction band is one layer and the highest valence band is another layer. So if you excite electrons and holes, the electrons all energetically want to go to MOSC2 and the holes energetically want to go to WSC2. And it, it, it seems at least possible that you can realize this stable yet, yet spatially indirect interlayer exciton. And again, because the electron and hole are separated spatially, you expect their lifetime to be much longer. Right? And this is really what, what we're looking for is do we have a way to realize a long-lived exciton that might have advantages that we want to try to um, realize transport of these exitons? And so the way we actually um, make these, again, is after we um, um, isolate and uh, um, characterize the individual monolayers, we uh, use this kind of polymer stamping technique. And so the way this works is if we have a glass slide, we, um, we make a transparent rubber stamp with, with um, some very clean, um, sticky thin film on top. We then uh, literally um, stamp it down onto our uh, model layer and then repeat the process over and over again to make a multi-layer structure. And so kind of the amazing thing about these Van der Waals header structures is the Van der Waals interaction between the layers is strong enough that they actually kind of self-clean. And so as long as you do this process well and carefully and your model layers are clean before, you can actually realize, you know, truly these atomically thin junctions with, with negligible contamination between layers. So it's, you know, from a surface science perspective, you might worry, oh, well, there's gonna be, oh, you know, water and films of organics between all these layers. It turns out that that doesn't happen. Um, what tends to happen is if you make a large area device, you'll get bubbles that form on certain regions and that's that, you know, organic buildup that kind of, you know, conglomerates together. And then there are um, you know, techniques, again, using things like atomic force microscopy to uh, do, you know, you know, they have cute names for a lot of things in 2D materials, but what they do is they essentially squeegee the, the device uh, after. And again, you know, my group, like many others, have adopted these sorts of techniques to realize very large area atomically thin structures. And so, and this is a, um, an early um, uh, device that we made. This is from a few years ago. Um, and so what we did is we, um, you know, stacked this MOSC2 layer on top of WSC2. Again, this is actually one of the bubbles. But again, these days we would just to remove it, but it, uh, it you know, didn't really affect this measurement. 
Um, and so what we did is we did photoluminescence. Again, that's this very basic semiconductor optics characterization technique. We excite with a green laser and then we look at the light emitted from the sample, again, at lower energy. We do it on the WSE2 region. We see uh, neutral and charged excitons that are well known from previous works. Um, if we then also did um, photoluminescence, oh, it's getting choppy. On the MOSE2 region, again, in neutral and charged excitons associated with that individual model layer. But then on the overlap region, why is this choppy? Um, we see that we get this additional low energy peak. And this actually matched um, almost right on where we would expect, given the, the band alignment and the binding energy of exit, of, uh, or the expected binding energy of these interlayer excitons to occur in, uh, in this kind of energy range. And so just I, I'm plotting everything here in electron volts, again, because I'm in a physics department. But for those of you who are uh, more optics oriented, so these monolayer excitons are um, essentially between 700 and 800 nanometers. And this interlayer exciton is down at about 920, 930 nanometers. So again, this is uh, really just kind of what we expected. Now again, um, um, so there's some other important properties I need to tell you about. So again, again, comparing to the previous work on semiconductor quantum wells, again, this is work by, um, you know, it was, I, it was explored very heavily about 20 years ago. Um, if you put two gallium arsenide quantum wells separated by an aluminum arsenide spacer, you can realize a very similar type of system where you have, a, again, an electron hole, which are spatially separated. And so what's neat about that is because you special spatially separated them, right, you have uh, you know, given whatever this uh, distance is, which you know in our case is about one nanometer, the spacing between um, um, the two layers, you end up generating a strong permanent electric dipole moment. And so because you have that electron dipole moment, um, you have an additional knob. So now instead of just having a neutral exciton that's in plane, right, you could potentially realize this out of plane permanent dipole moment to realize transport um, between uh, the the uh, um, uh, transport of these excitons kind of around your 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 device, and so um, um, we, I mentioned that because they're indirect, they should have a long lifetime. Again, we were um, the first group to measure that. Back, and this is old data from when I was a postdoc, um, and in fact, you get a, a short lifetime, uh, typically on order of about ten or twenty nanoseconds, and then a longer lifetime component, which really um, we're, we're just now understanding what's giving rise to that. And my group is in the process of um, um, uh, fi finalizing a paper on this sort of long uh, time dynamics right now. But again, compared to the monolayer, which had a lifetime of less than a picosecond, we see here the lifetime, um, it again has a shorter component of typically about 20 nanoseconds and then longer components of you know, typically um, 200 to 500 nanoseconds. So again, we've increased the excess on lifetime very significantly. Um, and again, this is from my past work. We, of course, have um, made a lot of progress in the last five years. But just to give you a sense of what I was talking about a minute ago, because the electron are separated, if we apply an out-of-plane electric field, which we can do just by you know, um, literally putting it between two pieces of graphene, which forms a parallel plate capacitor, we can apply an out-of-plane electric field. These days, we, we can do this without doping the sample. In this case, we were uh, simultaneously doping and applying an out-of-plane electric field. But what I want to emphasize here is you have an um, uh, uh, external electric field and you have this permanent dipole moment of the interlayer exciton. You're essentially pushing the electron hole closer or pulling them farther apart by applying this out-of-plane field. And what that does is it realizes a, a very large energy shift of this interlayer exciton. Again, in the past, we saw these energy shifts of about 50 mV, which um, MEV, which at the time was interesting, exciting. Um, you know, in, in my group now, where we're making more sophisticated structures with graphene uh, top and bottom gates, you can you can essentially shift these interlayer excitons by you know roughly 200 milli electron volts. So they're extremely tunable. Um, and again, um, something else though that really distinguishes this system from gallium arsenide, though, I, you know, is is the unusual band structure, which we've already talked about. And so again. When we think about these header structures, we think about an MOSC2 conduction band, right? That's the, the electron is associated with the MOSC2 conduction band being coupled together with the WSC2 valence band. Okay. And what's interesting is we can actually control how these bands align in momentum space 
by spatially controlling the twist angle in real space. So just by making you know, a zero degree twist angle structure, a one degree, a two degree, we can actually vary the twist angle, the angle alignment and momentum space of the plus K and minus K values. And again, when for the two special cases of zero and 60 degree, um, you end up getting um, uh, um, uh, certain optical selection rules, which are very similar, uh, not exactly the same, but very similar to what you get for individual monolayers. And again, there are again, two kind of flavors of these heterostructures though that, are, that distinguish them. There are the near zero degree heterostructures and the near 60 degree heterostructures. And um, even though the system, you know, we first um, you know, discovered back in uh, 2015, um, again, my, my group and others have really been trying to understand then what, um, you, know, you know, even though superficially the zero and 60 degree samples have um, some similarities, they actually behave very differently when, when, you, um, when you look closely. And again, that, that's what um, you know, my, my group is um, actively working on right now. Um, but again, just to uh, remind you a little bit about what this looks like, again, we have the monolayer excitons up here at high energy, these interlayer excitons at low energy. And so I, I mentioned that when the valleys align, you should have, a, again, a similar type of optical selection rule to control this, um, which valley the exciton exists in. And again, for this case of a zero degree uh, alignment, where you'd have the plus K valleys line up in momentum space, if you then pump with circularly polarized light, that's sigma plus, you'd expect the emission to also be sigma minus, or also be sigma plus. What's interesting is actually, if you look at the other flavor of heterostructure, um, um, you know, instead of looking at 60, if you look at zero degree, you get the opposite where you get the minus K lining up with the plus K. And in fact, the uh, polarization selection rule in that case is flipped. Um, but in this case, what we see is when we excite with sigma plus polarized, the emission is again, dominantly um, co-polarized with the emission. It's not a hundred percent like I showed you earlier for MOS2, but again, the, uh, um, that's for a number of reasons. Um, um, the, the, some of which are, are understood and some are not. One of the things that is understood um, very well is that, again, our angle alignment is not perfect, right? When we're assembling th these heterostructures, the way we do it is we have an optical technique that allows us to identify the crystal axes. We then do the stamping technique to assemble them. And then we're close to zero degree twist, but we're not exactly off. We're typically about one to two degrees off. And again, that um, it is um, really just a, a limitation with um, how good the graduate student is, to be honest. <laughs> we have some that are very, very close to zero, but you know, of course not exactly. Um, and again, um, you know, we, we went on to uh, um, study uh, the time resolved properties of this emission. And we actually saw that the long time component, if we look at the polarization, that's again, the, essentially the difference between the cone cross polarized photoluminescence as a function of time as a very long um, decay time of a couple hundred nanoseconds. And remember what I told you is we were interested, especially at the time with, um, you know, how is this system useful for some sort of, you know, spintronic like transport, but in this case it'd be a valleytronic type transport. And so because these excitons are long lived, um, you know, it might be possible to realize, you know, spatial transport of these excitons. And again, the simplest thing we could look at is just interlayer exciton diffusion. So essentially we're looking um, here at a spatial map of the photoluminescence. So we're exciting with our laser right here. And then we're looking at, in this case, the co-polarized emission, and this is the cross-polarized emission. We've used a long pass filter so that we can isolate just that low energy interlayer exciton peak. And we see, of course, that the peak is dominantly um, co-polarized, which I just showed you. And um, it's not obvious how I'm applying it here, but we actually see that, um, it, um, that you know, of course, we have two different spatial profiles, which, you know, show some evidence of diffusion and that the um, image of the photoluminescence is larger than the excitation spot, which is shown here by this dashed line. And so again, we did the next easiest thing we could think of is we um, actually looked at what, what is this, uh, what is this um, kind of um, exciton cloud look like as a function of power. So again, RR here corresponds to the co-polarized exciton emission, and this is the cross-polarized. And so what we did is we just turned up the power. What we saw was that this co-polarized emission ended up, um, when we then look at the difference between these curves, this co-polarized emission ends up diffusing much, much faster than the cross-polarized component. So that is the majority, um, the majority polarized valley 
diffuses much faster. And so that was, um, and that you know, gave rise to this kind of characteristic ring pattern that we see when we plot the uh, polarization. And so we uh, you know, worked again with our theory collaborators to develop a model of this, system, of this effect. And what we saw was um, for um, excitons in the same valley, so this is depicting an electron, two electron hole pairs, both in the plus K valley for the header structure. And this is one in the plus K valley and one for the minus K valley. Well, these inner layer excitons always want to diffuse away from each other. That's obvious because you have a, you know, this permanent dipole and you want to, if you think about them next to each other, they inherently have a repulsive dipole dipole, you know, interaction because of this permanent dipole. So that does, doesn't really distinguish between the two valleys. You have that effect and it's a, a, about the same for, um, uh, for excitons and holes in, or is this, uh, the same for excitons in uh, the same in different valleys because that's just a real space interaction. But in addition to that, you have a repulsive exchange interaction associated with the, um, if you just consider the, the holes in the um, WLC2 valence band and the electrons in the MLC2 conduction band, they have a repulsive exchange interaction, which you can understand in terms of like a, 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 a you know, poly exclusion principle concept where they, they want, you know, they don't, you know, they're not allowed to be in the same state. So there's an additional repulsive interaction, which is an exchange term. And so what that means is that the majority carrier in, in this, uh, in this, you know, in the same valley has an additional repulsive force that drives them apart faster. So now if we consider at time equals zero, we inject uh, excitons essentially at our laser spot, but at time t later, the um, plus k um, excitons diffuse much faster. And then if we plot the difference here, which is just, this is some a theory of this drift diffusion model, we end up seeing that we, we get this characteristic uh, diffusion pattern. And again, um, um, this, this is again, kind of a summary of what I worked on back when I was a postdoc. And um, a lot has actually happened since then. And so, you know, at the time I was really interested in looking at um, this valley diffusion and, and trying to manipulate um, exciton valley currents. And this idea of, um, you know, encoding information in the valley degree of freedom, I think is still justified, but I actually am more interested in a different context. And so it was um, again shown uh, two, about two years ago now that, um, um, you know, that the picture is actually a little bit more complicated than what I told you about at the time. And, um, you know, um, what ends up happening is when you have these two headers, these two monolayers on top of each other, um, even when they're aligned, they have a slight lattice mismatch. And that gives rise to this periodic potential, which is essentially a super lattice defined by the, you know, either the, either the twist angle between layers or just the lattice mismatch. And so again, when we go back to when I said very early on is in these 2D header structures, I said, this is great because we don't have to worry about lattice matching. And this was um, something that I, I feel like a lot of people said, and myself included, um, you know, five, six years ago. Well, um, since then, there's been a flurry of activity, including this um, you know, small twist angle and bilayer graphene, which has shown exactly how important the twist angle between layers is. Again, I, I you, know, my, you know, my work, of course, um, in, you know, and the uh, you know, you know, bilayer semiconductor header structures, of course, is you know, some evidence of that because you only get these bright inner layer excitons when they line up in the momentum space. But um, well, anyway, so what ends up happening, I should say, is you get this um, spatially modulated periodic potential, which comes about because of the interaction between layers. And this is known as a, a Mare potential. That just means that you have a, a, a Mare, you know, is just a, you know, any kind of um, spatial modulation that comes because of you, know, you essentially have two periodic structures on top of each other. And, but what happens is you end up, um, this is a plot of the Mare potential for interlayer excitons as a function of space. And so what ends up happening is um, even though we, at high power and higher temperatures, as I just showed you, you do see this exciton diffusion, which um, you know, isn't terribly long range. If you're looking at the numbers, you saw that these excitons diffuse typically you know, four or five microns. Um, well, there's a reason why the exciton diffusion isn't that great. And that's because these, these, um, they're kind of lying on this very deep uh, potential. And again, they, you know, whether not, this is a theory plot uh, here, whether or not these numbers corresponding to a very deep Mare potentials of, you know, in this case, showing as deep as 100 milli electron volts, uh, that, that's, I think, still um, uh, being investigated, including by my own group. But again, there's, um, 
There is evidence though, I should say, that when you cool down, um, when, when you do the same experiment, you look at these heterostructures on very clean devices, but if you go down to very low temperatures, less than 10 Kelvin, so, um, uh, um, and you look at very low excitation powers compared to the high, you see what essentially looks like quantum dots. And that's because what you've done is you've localized these inner layer excitons to these little moiré traps. And so this is an example of a high power photoluminescent spectrum and a low power photoluminescent spectrum. And again, um, you know, you know, I can't get mad at him because he was my postdoc advisor and we're working on a similar system. But um, my, um, again, Xiaodong, um, of course, uh, uh, published a paper on this a couple of years ago. Um, my group is also uh, working on this around the same time. Um, but uh, of course, at, at high power, we see this kind of broader feature and then at low power, you see these narrow lines. And again, these narrow lines are very characteristic of, um, of trapped excitons, very similar to what you'd get from quantum dots or um, other, you know, you know, isolated single um, molecule type experiments. And again, my group, um, again, we have, uh, like I said, three projects actually actively working on controlling these sorts of mare excitons for, for different um, applications. Some are more basic kind of matter physics and other are um, more related to quantum information science, but I uh, need to move on. Um, and so, um, uh, let me talk a little bit about this very different direction that, um, again, one project in my lab, and that's um, really based on this kind of 2D semiconductor plasmonics. Um, so there's been, a, again, a, a decent amount of work looking at what happens when you take these TMD semiconductors and you um, transfer them onto different sorts of plasmonic structures. And so, again, one of the um, interesting things that people have done is, uh, this is an optical, or I'm sorry, this is actually an, an SEM of a monolayer flake on top of a... Um, of a, of a periodic array of these little uh, silver nano disks. And uh, what a, a number of people have looked at is how to enhance things like the um, uh, um, second order um, nonlinear response of this hybrid 2D semiconductor plasmonic structure, essentially by enhancing the local fields using these um, um, like resonance plasmonic structures. There's also been uh, some work by um, the Harvard group and my group looking at um, how, like what happens when you look at um, propagating surface plasmon polaritons coupled to these excitons in these 2D systems. And again, um, you know, this is always a crowded field, so I'm not the only one who has these ideas, but um, let me just very quickly remind you of what this is. And so surface plasmon polariton are propagating waves that occur at metal dielectric interfaces. So it's essentially a, a plasmon, so a charge oscillation of metal coupled to an electric field which propagates. And so if you're not familiar with this, you can, you know, to the lowest order, think about this like a guided light wave that uh, is allowed by Maxwell's equations that, that, that lives at the surface of a metal. And again, so it's a propagating wave, but it um, 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 is, is again localized to the surface. And so um, what we did is we're interested in, you know, can we use these sorts of surface plasmon polaritons to actually do um, uh, uh, nonlinear spectroscopy to realize very large nonlinearities using these semiconductor excitons. And so again, my student Matt uh, did a lot of work you know, developing these relatively simple waveguides, but with um, uh, these grading couplers. Again, the uh, the wavelength of surface plasmons is a little bit shorter than the wavelength of free space photons, so you have to make up for that wavelength mismatch by essentially breaking translation symmetry. So um, that practically means putting grooves um, on your device, which you know uh, allow for that um, um, momentum mismatch. And so again, Matt designed these to work well with our TMD semiconductors. He did um, these sorts of um, FTTD simulations using um, programs like um, Lumerical and Comsol to, to understand um, you know, how, um, how to design these structures to essentially have single mode operation or near single mode operation. Um, again, we use the same basic technique. And this is an example of a device that Matt made again um, I haven't told you about this 2D material yet, but what we do is we take our 2D semiconductor and we encapsulate it in HBN. So HBN, hexagonal boron nitride, is essentially a, a, a simplified way of thinking about it is it's kind of like two-dimensional glass. It's a very large band gap insulator, which is used very, and it's very, very high, high quality with, um, um, and so it's used routinely in you know, both graphene and, and really all 2D uh, devices. Uh, these days to realize very, very clean near um, intrinsic properties of the um, materials that we're, we're studying. So it's, it's essentially just an encapsulation layer. Uh, 
Um, and, and again, this is a, again, an AFM, where again, this is an input coupler, an output coupler, and this is the active part of the device. So we have, what we do is we launch, um, we have a, a laser that launches surface plasmon flaritons that propagate through this waveguide, interact with the 2D layer that's encapsulated in HBN and then is out coupled. And so this is kind of interesting. So first, if we look at the red curve, that's the transmission of one of our bare waveguides in the absence of the 2D layer. Now, if we put this encapsulated WC2 layer on top, we get an extremely strong absorption of about a 73% change from the bare waveguide. And again, part of that's because what we've done is instead of shooting our laser beam like this through our 2D material, where we're only interacting with 0.7 nanometers, here we're interacting with um, um, a very, uh, our interaction length is very long, right? It's on order of a few microns. Now there's a, a little bit of a trade-off, which I'll discuss uh, shortly about the, that geometry versus the, the traditional optical geometry. But just uh, to make sure we understand things, um, we did this as a function of a layer thickness. And we saw that again, essentially the other sample follows Beer's law, which is what you'd expect. And, um, and so, um, in order to understand this, we've uh, collaborated with Rolf Binder um, here at U of A in optical sciences to develop a, um, a model, again, using a, a Drude model for the um, uh, metal and a Lorentz oscillator for the excitons in the 2D material. And so this is just the dispersion relation for the, um, the basic uh, plas the surface plasma polariton of the waveguide. And if you zoom in, you actually see a small kink here, you get a similar type of resonance that occurs. And this is, what this is, is this is actually a hybrid um, particle that is um, the exciton in the 2D in the 2D semiconductor coupled to the surface plasmon polariton, and so um, this is yet you know an even more complicated kind of polariton, which is a combination of a photon, a charge oscillation, a plasmon, and the exciton. And so there's um, a number of really interesting um, um, nonlinear properties that come about because of that 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 new kind of three particle um, um, polariton. Um, which I'll, I'll just give it a little bit of a, a taste of what we're working on now. And so, um, you know, what we essentially did was we did different types of pump probe experiments where we're essentially straining a laser, uh, a probe laser through the device to serve as a probe, a pump laser optically in this case. And what we see is a pump induced transmission. Differential transmission is um, the technique we use, which is again, just looking at the pump induced change to the probe transmission. And again, this is linear, uh, which again, for those of us in nonlinear spectroscopy, are, um, use as a sanity check to know that we're in the, the kind of perturbation limit, the chi three limit. Um, similarly, though, we did kind of the next experiment you could think of. Instead of pumping optically, we do both uh, pump and probe uh, while propagating through the device. And again, this is just looking at the DT re resonance as a function of energy with three different pump wavelengths. And we again see that it's linear, so we're still in the chi three regime. But whereas the previous slide, which showed a DT response of about um, a part per thousand, here we get a relatively large uh, uh, DT response of about 4%. So this is, this is about you know, 10 times bigger than what we had for the optical pump uh, uh, plasma and probe case, which again, you know, we, we can understand in terms of um, surface, this kind of hybrid exciton surface plasma and polariton um, nonlinear response. Um, this uh, number is, um, um, uh, of the, uh, the two-dimensional chi-3 is, is really just for um, aficionados, I guess. Um, and then uh, finally, we showed, we did some time-resolved measurements showing, again, that, um, you know, what the response time was of this, um, of this system. And we again see a very fast initial decay of about 290 femtoseconds and a slower time component of about 13 picoseconds. And so this is, um, what, what's interesting is if you think about this in context of an optical device, this is an, essentially an all-optical modulator where the pump pulse serves as the control and the probe pulse serves as the uh, signal. And what's interesting is this fast component of 290, femtosec 290 femtoseconds is actually one of the fastest ever on-chip all optical modulator um, uh, demonstrations. And so just for um, comparison, we actually compared our work to other state-of-the-art plasmonic structures, um, traditional materials, um, I mean by that are the systems like you know gallium arsenide waveguide structures and um, graphene as well. And you see um, I'm comparing the time scales in picoseconds where we're, we're um, um, I, I think um, 
I, I'm fairly confident we're the fastest. So, so uh, you know, I'm, I won't be surprised if at some point someone argues with me. Um, and then we are also relatively low uh, pulse energy. The, the problem though, um, so far, just if we look at our, our structure from a device perspective is our modulation depth is much smaller than what was achieved with traditional materials. Part of this is that this is a physicist's version of a device, not an engineer's. We really made this to understand the fundamental interactions between surface plasma and polaritons and these excitons. When we're comparing to these traditional and graphing structures, a lot of these involve um, you know, like cavity type structures where essentially you're doing things like multi-passing the, the active layer, which is again, something that um, you know, we're thinking about down the road, but certainly isn't um, um, our highest priority at this point. And so um, we published a paper on, on this work last year, and we're uh, soon to publish another one on a related experiment just to give you a flavor of what um, that looks like. Um, we've now developed these uh, cross waveguide structures, which essentially, unlike before, where we were pumping and probing along the same direction. Now we can pump along one direction, and probe along the other. This is an um, optical image of one of the devices, again, that Matt has made. This is just a little bit of data to get you maybe some of your attention. Whereas before we saw a DT over T response of, in this case, so this one's a little bit lower, about 3%, similar to what I showed you a minute ago. In this cross pumping structure, we can actually get a DT over T of over, um, in this case, this is about 160%, right? So this is um, a hundred fold increase in the differential transmission signal. And in this case, the differential transmission signal is actually larger than the transmission when we're on resonance. And so we're, um, again, working on, um, um, other uh, similar experiments where we're, we're trying to understand again the nature of this exciton surface plasma polariton interaction. So again, th this is um, a work in progress, um, which um, hopefully will be published soon. And so in this talk, I talked about um, the 2D header structures and these plasmonic structures. And again, I'd just like to leave with thanking my group again and asking if there are any questions. So, thank you. Thanks, John. Um, uh, I. If you guys have any questions, I think uh, some of the students have left already uh, at around 11.50 because they had a class at 12. I should have probably warned you about it. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, it was no, no, minutes. it's my fault. I'm sorry. I thought no, I had the hour. But, but <laughs> I was, no, not at all. I was so engrossed. I didn't even check the time. I was just uh, watching the video. So let me start off the proceedings if anyone, if no one else has, a, has questions or people are feeling shy to ask questions. Anyone? So, okay, uh, just to let you know, John, there were around 70 who signed up and in the last 10 minutes, we had like 27 who signed off, I think. So I think that's a great uh, total that we had. So thanks once again. Sure. Oh, um, Sumit has a question. Sure. Sumit, go, ha go ahead and uh, turn on your audio. Hello? So me, we, we can't hear you. Do I have to do something or? No, I think he had a question, but. Uh... We'll move this so I can actually see. Or... Okay, I unmuted myself. Okay. Uh, okay, John, thank you for a great talk. I had a question from the middle of your talk. Uh huh. You had these two components in the decay of your interlayer exciton, right? The yes, first... yes. Uh, did you actually tell us what the two components? I'm interested in the slow component. What is that? Yeah, so again, that's what we're, we're, is this still being recorded? <laughs> um, I, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about it. Maybe we can talk offline about the rest of it. <laughs> we have lots of data on this actually. Um, so um, again, the, all the diagrams I showed you in, in this talk are very simplified, where we're only considering, um, uh, um, so remember that the, the conduction band is from the MOSC2, right? And so there's a, there's actually a spin splitting. There's a, there are different types of interlayer excitons. Um, you know, there's a singlet, triplet, and there's both intervalley and intravalley, which again, in, in, in this kind of overview talk, I, I leave those details out. But um, um, it, it, um, that, that slow component is likely from a, um, um, a, an, a, an intervalley interlayer exciton. So that would be both um, spatially indirect and momentum space indirect. And it's, I think, likely due to the scattering of that, that, you know, so that's a, 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 a forbidden transition, that scattering back. And so I, you know, I think it's kind of reminiscent of a triplet state in a 
molecular system and an inner system crossing, like that that decay rate back to the bright state. And uh, uh, you expect them to have the same energies, the same uh, polarization nope. and opposite polarization? I mean, um, because I thought you were talking about some exchange splitting. Right. So in this case, what, what in that measurement, we were measuring at the bright exciton energy. So the picture I have um, now based on a lot of more measurements um, is that um, we have a dark intervalley exciton that's scattering back to a bright exciton. And we're seeing the, the emission then at, at the bright exciton energy. So it's something like a delayed fluorescence or something, delayed luminescence? Yeah, that's, that's, what, I, that's what I think is going on. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Um. Yes, I have a question. Um, nice talk, thank you very much. Um, I'm a chemist, I'm not a physicist. Uh, so this would be a question in regard to the materials you discussed or maybe potentially different materials. We are working on um, maxines. I don't mm -hmm, know if mm -hmm. you are familiar with these relatively new type of 2D material. They're metallic though. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering, and I, I know that there's some um, work out there where people claim that they could be semiconducting. Have you come across any um, sort of materials that sort of belong to that um, class of materials for your types of applications? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I, I've definitely heard of, um, yeah, MXCs in the literature. I'm not familiar enough to comment on that. Um, if it's something you're working on, though, we should have another conversation because even yeah. if they are metallic, um, they are. Okay. I'm um, again. I can only talk about so many things, but um, mm -hmm. we're, so we're. Um, I don't know. So so Seth, you're at ASU also, right? Um, so, yeah. so 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 Seth was a, a collaborator with us on this um, mm -hmm. NSF MRI to get this uh, cryogenic ensemble, which is actually mm -hmm. <laughs> is actually supposed to come here in the next this month, actually. Um, and okay. in theory is going to be installed. That's, mm -hmm. that's the harder part to be sure about, <laughs> but it should be here at least. Um, and so I'm, def I'm, um, I'm definitely interested. I, I don't mean to, to take your question in a different direction, but if you have some new 2D metals, um, mm -hmm. I'm definitely interested in them. And we should, we should okay. talk more about that because um, yeah. we, we've got a handful of them that we're um, interested in. And so in, in, in those systems, what I'm really interested in is, um, so the, I talked about surface plasmon polaritons in this talk in the context of these traditional metal systems, but the 2D plasmons uh, actually are very, very different um, mm -hmm. than, um, than a traditional, um, even, even than traditional plasmons in, in like thin layers of gold. Um, mm -hmm. And again, um, so, so, uh, I, so uh, please, um, I, I hope you email me and we can start a conversation. Yeah, yeah, that would be interesting for sure. Because, um, yeah, we're not, as I said, we're not experts in the in the physics of any of the materials that we make, but uh, we're good at making them. So. Uh, and are, are uh, they yeah. in? Are they solution processed? Or are these? You know? Yes. So they form they form um, stable colloidal solutions. Okay. Um, and also, we can basically dry them as like a shiny um, film. Huh. Um, so we could even get a powder of it, but it depends on the level of delamination. First, we have multi layers, and then we delaminate them into more like single layers or few layered structures. Um, and it depends on where we interrupt the synthesis process, basically, um, if we have a powder or if we have a colloidal solution. Yeah. So for, you, for us, um, you know, it's you know, again, again I'm I'm interested in, in in new directions as well. But you know, typically, and may, hopefully, it's clear. Typically, we're working with um, yeah, you know uh, you know solid state samples that are on mm -hmm. um, somehow transferred onto you know flat substrates. And so, if there's yeah. a way to you know isolate these down, they don't necessarily have to be monolayer, but at least yeah. you know, less than ten nanometers, yeah. um, um, and then onto you know a, a sapphire or uh, you know silicon substrate. Um, yeah. that would definitely be something we could we could talk about look, working on together. Okay. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you. Uh, um, so anyone else? Just had a very basic question, John, like how do you control the angle the, of rotation in the way you do your transfer between two successive 
players? I mean, is it, do you yes. do it and then interrogate it or is there a way that you know how to do it? Um, yeah, so there's a way we kind of know how to, my screen's still shared, is that right? Yeah. Okay. So this is a slide that I used to include, but not, the problem is maybe you, you all have had this too. Since I became a professor, I talk so much more. <laughs> I, I go through half as many slides as I used to go through. <laughs> anyway, um, hopefully that's useful. I hopefully don't bore people. Um, so what we do is we do, um, you know, th this is just a cartoon. We, we do second harmonic generation as a function of excitation and detection angle. So what we do is we, we come in with, for example, an 800 nanometer laser, um, a pulse laser, and then we use, um, you know, essentially a wave plate to then rotate that laser. And we record the uh, intensity of the second harmonic generation as a function of angle. And I have a very simple way to explain how this works. And, and, and so, so we do that, um, we know which direction, you know, our polarization is on our sample and we take a picture of our sample. So from the optical image and from that angle result SHG data, we can at least figure out modulo 60 degrees where we are. And why, why that happens is, if you remember the top-down view of our crystal, it looks like this. So this is, um, I forget what color scheme I used earlier. So, um, um, I, okay, so this is a calcogen atom and this is a, a metal atom, okay. If we look along this axis, we see here, there's a metal here, there's a calcogen, right? So that, along that axis has broken inversion symmetry. Mm -hmm. Similarly along this axis, similarly on the, this axis. So that corresponds to where the SHG is strong. Here though, we see if we you know, just look at the inversion symmetry along this axis, it has inversion symmetry, where we go from here to here to here to here, it's the same. And so that's, that's how we get this polarization result SHG signal. We're essentially measuring the crystal. So um, we, there is a way where you can actually figure out if it's a zero, like where zero and where 60 is. Um, that's a little more complicated. Um, we actually don't bother to do it because we're usually interested in both zero and 60 degree samples. So we, we know that we're either making a near zero or a near 60. And then once we fabricate it, there's a couple different ways that we can check if it's near zero or near 60. Now that we, um, now that we know the system as, as well as we do. One simple way you could do it is you do SHG again. The, the near zero ones have a strong SHG signal. The 60 degree ones have, a, and have, a, have essentially zero SHG as independent of angle because Again, the bilayers actually have an inversion symmetry in their natural stacking. So, okay. But that gives you a sense. It's um, it's a little involved, um, but but we do it. Okay. So one other, I mean, because you spoke about the cryogenic ensemble, uh, is there a, is there going to be a temperature dependent lifetime for these excitons that that's going to be useful or? Yeah, there, there is, and I, I mean, that's a great question. That's related to Schumann's question too, as, as, um, as my group has sort of recently figured, I keep alluding to this paper. Again, if this hadn't been recorded, I would have showed you all of this. No, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a, a paper to come very, very soon. <laughs> I'll say that. Okay. Uh, if, you, if you call me off, off of record, I'll, I'll tell you the details. Okay, sounds great. Uh, anyone else? Otherwise- uh, a question from Priyadarshini. Oh, yeah, yeah, Pradeshni, sorry. Yeah, I just want to know, I mean, what is actually mean by broken symmetry, it's physical significance, and... Oh, oh, so in this context, in second harmonic generation, um, okay, inversion symmetry, if we take this to be, um, so, it, you know, this is a lot of physics lingo, I should be clear what I'm talking about. Um, so broken inversion symmetry means that if, if I take this as like my r equals zero, and if I go from plus R to minus R, is the crystal symmetric or not symmetric? In this case, it clearly isn't, right? If this is my plus R, if then I go to minus R, I see that it's a different flavor of atom, right? Instead of a metal atom, it's a calcogen atom. And so that's what I mean by broken inversion symmetry. Does that help you understand? Oh, and why, so why does that give you an SHG signal? Um, I'll, I'll give a very simple, I should have a cartoon for this, I don't, but in order to get an SHG signal, um, you have to have, um, why do you need broken inversion symmetry? Well, um, um, you essentially need it to be, you, you need a crystal or a, a system where it's easier to, if, to push an electron one direction than it is to push the electron the other direction. 
Okay, and that's what you have when you have broken inversion symmetry. If it was, if it was just as easy to push it in one direction and the other direction, um, then you you just get back, um, you know, and, and the potential is harmonic. Um, then you just get back, um, you know, the, the light generated would be at the same frequency as the excitation light. That's just normal, like really scattering. But in order to get this sort of um, second harmonic generation, you need to break the symmetry, and and that's that's what's really um, at least the, the simple classical picture of how to understand this. If you, if you want to read more, there's a great book um, by Robert Boyd called Nonlinear Optics. And I think it's his chapter one. He just does this amazing job at explaining this in a, like, so it's completely clear. So I, if you, and you can read that, you know, on a Saturday night, well, you know, relaxing. It's, it's very readable. Yeah, I will go through it. Thank you for referring them. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? I think we are getting really close to the end of the talk. Officially, you know, the, the recording ends at 12.15, so. Okay, yeah, I'm happy if there's any more questions, but. Um, anyone else? Otherwise, feel free to uh, reach out to John. I think he's it's very easily accessible on email, I assume, John. Like if people want, want to collaborate, talk to you or whatever, that's, that's the best way to catch one of you, right? Yeah, absolutely. And especially, you know, again, I, you know, my group, we, we mostly do right now we're doing far field, you know, and I didn't talk about all, all of our capabilities, but, um, but, you know, I'm really, I'm excited about, you know, some new collaborations now that we have this ensemble. I think that's going to, that's going to be you. a lot of fun. Okay, great. So with that, once again, let's thank John for a great talk. Um, and uh, again, just wanted to let you know that there were like around 72 uh, people who had logged in, John, which is oh, great. great, I think. So, and I think we usually get some more on YouTube. So, yeah, yeah, we had a good turnout, and uh, yeah, I although it's not my area, John, I think I, I learned a lot, uh, and it was really <laughs> good. you you learned you learned enough not to do excite towns and semiconductors anymore. <laughs> <laughs> great, thanks, John, and see you all. all right, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.